not good enough is not a reason to per- keep from acting. You got to start somewhere. Like if you end up with a 4.0, great. But if you open, if you never crack the book because you're saying to yourself, whatever I do today is not going to be good enough. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. So let's get on to the meat and bones of the training. All right. So, um, so the first thing that we're going to try to do is explain a little bit about how motivation, like how we can understand motivation. So if you look at motivation, there are actually a bunch of different disciplines that like will talk about motivation and behavior. So for example, there's neuroscience, there's psychology, there's even behavioral economics, there's spirituality, even like the system of psychotherapy has its own tradition about understanding motivation. There are also like these more novel approaches to motivation. So there's like the self-help section, right, of like the bookstore where people are sort of talking about personal experiences of motivation. And my most most recent favorite one is like they're all the, the life hacks, right? So you have like in our society, when you look at motivation, there are a lot of different disciplines and approaches that people will take to actually like figuring out, okay, what is my motivation? Like, how does motivation work? Like, how do I fix this problem? So then the question becomes, okay, if we're coaches and we're here to help clients sort of fix this problem, how are we going to approach it? And so what we're going to start with, as we do with most things in Healthy Gamers, we're actually going to start with sort of the yogic approach. And then what we're going to do is sprinkle in, I think, key findings from psychology and neuroscience and also some things from like psychotherapy and stuff, you'll find that a lot of this stuff is actually baked into um, the curriculums that y'all have already gone through. But we're going to kind of take a step back and think about it. So like I was saying earlier, there's no Sanskrit word for motivation because motivation is actually an umbrella term. So what do y'all think are the components of motivation? Like what do you think determines whether someone is motivated or not? Intrinsic value. What does that mean? When they sort of have a purpose that they care about, that they can work and commit towards working. Okay. So a, a sense of value. What else? What do you think? Like what goes into like, come on, like when y'all are motivated towards something or not motivated towards something, what goes into that? Uh, okay. there's one. <laughs> oh, wow. There we go. Four people. <laughs> Let's start with Steven. Ease of access is a big one. Like how likely am I to get that thing? Okay. What else? I was going to say desire for the outcome. Desire for the outcome. Sure. Right. So there's like outcome orientation. There's like likelihood of success. Great. How do you like feel about it? Like your emotional, like sort of attitude towards it. Okay. Your emotional attitude towards it. Right. So let's say that all I have to do is go to class and I'll get the points for attendance, right? Likelihood of success is very high. And yet, my emotional attitude can keep me from going to to class, right? Brian, what did you say? Can you all hear him? Or is it just me? No. No. We can't hear him. GG. Oh, oh, you can hear me? There you go. Now now we can. Hey, August. Okay, yeah. What I was saying is, um, like, just like, like fulfilling a purpose. Or like a, okay. yeah, my analogy is like, just like filling up a hole, like that you just dug up or something like that. That's how I imagine. Okay, great. Willingness to suffer. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, like what level of tolerance do you have for going through whatever adversity you're going to have to go through for this goal, right? So okay. like the adversity to getting a snack might be walking up the stairs. That's not a lot of adversity. I can go through that, but maybe to getting a PhD, the adversity is years of struggle and sacrificing, having fun so I can study. And yeah, that might so, be a lot more. So uh, spot on. So this is where, uh, crap, my iPad is pooping out. Hold on. Okay. So the first thing that I, I kind of want to point out is that um, <clears throat> if we look at motivation, y'all are coming up with like a lot of different things, right? There's like, what's the likelihood of success? There's like how you feel about it, what the outcome is, how important it is to you. Um, There are lots of different attributes that we can kind of think of when it comes to like what goes into motivation. So this is the first problem with motivation is that when people say that they're unmotivated, they don't know like which of these things is the problem. 
you know, am I not engaging in the action because I believe that the likelihood of success is low? So let's take a step back for a second and imagine that I have an ahamkar that views me as a failure. Who wants to explain real quick for the people who are streaming what an ahamkar is? The ego. It's the okay. part of your mind that's trying to prevent you from, you know, incurring any damage. It's trying to like, you know, sort of ease you into like, or not really ease, but it's trying to protect you from anything that's like kind of unusual or uncomfortable or like, you know, undesirable. Yep. So if I have an identity or ego as a failure, what do you think that does to my calculation of the likelihood of success of taking an action? It's going to say that you're going to fail, so so don't do it in the first place. Exactly, right? So like if we think about this as coaches, like this is kind of interesting because someone says, oh, I'm not motivated to do something. Whereas the reason they're not motivated is because the calculation in their mind sets the likelihood of success as very low. And therefore, it's not worth doing. And so if we think about like, this is kind of tricky because when this client comes in and they say, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to find a romantic partner, but I can't because I'm ugly. Like, how would you work with that person as a coach? Help them explore where they got the idea of how they are ugly and like, Perfect. what is their perspective on that? Perfect. Right. So, so like this is, and this is the real challenge that we have as coaches is that a lot of times what will happen is that coaches will come in with a particular goal, but like if they want to find a romantic partner and then what they'll do is they'll go to like pick up artists or like, you know, whatever to learn particular skills. Whereas like that's the treatment that the, the solution that the client is coming up with is actually based on like a false formulation of where their problem is. So instead, like by understanding concepts like a hump car and you sort of realize like, oh, the problem is like you can learn as many pickup skills as you want to. But as long as you are, you know, asking someone out and you feel like you're not worth dating and that you're a failure, that's going to come across as unattractive, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then like, you know, they'll reject you. Oh, I'm more of a failure. And the next person that you ask out, you're kind of like re like you're kind of like exuding that like loser musk. Right. And that makes you like less attractive. And then you kind of fail again. And so what we try to do in coaching is once we understand, oh, this is actually a problem of a humkar where they think going into the interaction that they're doomed to failure. So once we sort of decompress that a humkar, we start to ask them, hey, where did you get the idea that you're a failure to begin with? Once we kind of sit with them and work with them, and as that identity goes down, like what we'll observe, and this is, I'm sure you all, you all have seen this, you know, where like you're working with a client and they seem like super stuck and you're sitting there week after week, like helping them understand themselves. And then like the next week they just go and like do what they were supposed to do. Have y'all had that experience before? Yeah. So everyone's nodding because people can't see that. Who here wants to share an experience, not really violating privacy or anything like that, but who here wants to share an experience about that with a client? Like, has anyone, can anyone say something like where you thought you were doing a terrible job? It didn't seem like y'all were getting anywhere. And then all of a sudden... <coughs> Anyone feel like sharing? Yeah, I, oh, I I'll share one. Oh, go ahead, David. Um, yeah, I had a client, and I'm going to talk slow just to make sure that I'm not sort of violating anything. Um, but I had a client um, for about 16 weeks, um, and we sort of just kept exploring and understanding, and um, sort of there, they kept talking about their goals and didn't really feel like they were getting anywhere. Um, and then, you know, I, I felt like I wasn't doing anything. Um, they never sort of reported back any like progress or anything. And then I think it was, it, I think it was before 16 weeks, probably like 12 or 13. They just sort of had this story of, yeah, they went out and did everything that they had wanted to do. And up until that point, I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm doing nothing. I don't know what I'm doing. I like brought the case to like supervision a bunch. Um, and then, yeah, like they just turned around and like, oh yeah, this has been super helpful. Like I have a great understanding of everything. Thanks. And it was, it was good after that. Great. Yeah. So I, I think that's where it's, it's interesting, but even in psychiatry, we have a saying that all boats rise together. And so I think a big part of what we do in coaching is helping people like, and people do this in therapy as well. I mean, it's a, like a general observation of humans that a lot of times, you know, there's some fundamental things that hold us, that keep us from like moving forward in multiple dimensions of our lives. And so I, I think part of the key thing, did somebody else want to share before we move on? I have a success case if I'm sure go for it. Um, I had a client who 
we spent like maybe like four or five weeks really trying to get him like outside of his house. He like spent a whole bunch of time indoors um, and like could never really get there. And then he really wanted to go for a walk down the street to get some like some breakfast. And one day he did, or so like we had our session, he had his week. He had, he then later told me that on the first day he went out and did it, realized it actually wasn't too bad. And like, went like another three or four times and went to the gym twice that week and like all of a sudden just crushed all his goals and it was really now he's a crusher yeah so so i know it sounds kind of weird but we're, what we're going to explain to y'all over the next four days is why that happens okay we're going to start to talk a little bit about like so we've we've figured this out so on the back end at hg what we've done is like done all these calculations it goes into the way that y'all like the curriculum that we put you y'all through and so y'all are already doing it. And now we're going to kind of bump y'all up to the next level by teaching y'all how that happens and why that happens. So the first thing that I want to share about motivation is that it's an emergent property. And so what I mean by that is if we listen to what y'all are saying, y'all are saying, okay, there's like emotions involved. There's like likelihood of success involved. There are all these different variables that go into mo motivation. And the challenge with like um, issues of motivation is that when a client feels like they're not motivated, like what they see is an emergent property, right? So what we're going to see from, from Eli's case, for example, is someone who's doing all their things from David's case. It's someone who's crushing it on all levels. And then the question kind of becomes like, well, how do I duplicate that? So when we look at, so motivation is a term, and this is why I don't think there's a Sanskrit word for motivation. It's a term that is designed from external observation. So if you look within yourself, you won't find motivation. You'll find emotions. You'll find desires. You'll find things that you care about. But motivation is something when I look at someone who's crushing it on the outside and I look at them and I make a judgment from the outside, I call them motivation. So motivation is almost like this emergent property that people see from the outside. And if you go and you talk to someone who goes to the gym every day, I know it sounds kind of weird, but they won't say that they're highly motivated. It's not like they get up every day and are like filled with like passion and like, yeah, like I'm going to go to the gym. It's just like, they're like, no, it's just kind of like what I do now. You know, I just, I, it makes me feel better. But there's sort of this idea of like, of motivation, which is built from people standing on the outside and watching someone else and saying, oh, wow, that person must be like intrinsically driven in some deep and profound way that I don't feel. And the reason that they make that conclusion is because on the inside, what they feel is something deep and profound that keeps them stuck. So as we kind of understand motivation, what we're going to try to do is unpack, like, what are all of the things that go into it? And as we unpack all of the different variables of motivation, my hope is that y'all as coaches will be able to help their clients figure out, like, what's the problem here? And this is also why we have a, a, a gigantic motivation, like, industry. We have tons of information about motivation, and we have the least motivated generation, like, in the history of humanity. I don't know if that's actually factually true or not. It's how it feels. And so it's kind of interesting because how can we account for sort of like this discrepancy between all the information that's out there and how unmotivated people are? And we'll kind of get to that. I think the issue is that, you know, when I look at a life hack or I look at like a success YouTuber, they're not going to be able to like tailor what they say to me, right? There's no process of like interaction where we can figure out, okay, which advice is actually the advice that I should follow. So we have people like consuming all this advice and like not making changes in their life. So the real advantage, and, and this is where I think this is your duty as a coach, is to understand all these different dimensions and help a client figure out, okay, what are we dealing with here? Is this an issue of a hump god? Is this an issue of manas? Is this an issue where like you feel too much emotion or negative shame? Is this an issue where there are people around you who are like, you know, preventing you from being your best self? Like, do you have like, you know, are your gamer buddies like, messaging you, you know, at, at 5 p.m. every day and want you to get on and like play games with them. Like, how does that impact your motivation the next day? So as a coach, really the key thing here is that as we teach you this model, like you need to take this model and apply it to your clients so that you can guide them in a more specific manner. There's also other advantages to that, which we'll kind of get to. Questions about that? Okay. So kind of the analogy that I'd use about motivation just to kind of wrap up is, remember, I kind of called it an emergent property. And so the thing about emergent properties is that any individual component does not appear to be like responsible for what we see. And just like, you know, you can look at a, um, a uh, just like you can look at 
like a, a, a bird, right? And you can look at the property of flight. It's not the muscle that creates flight. It's not the bone that creates flight. It's not the, the wing that creates flight. And what happens is we have clients that look around and they see other birds flying and they themselves don't see themselves flying. And so then what happens is they just end up basically like, um, uh, you know, they, they end up trying to figure out why can't I fly? And it's your job as a coach to basically help them figure out, okay, what's, what's the part of your wing that's busted? Okay. Okay. So, um, next thing that we're going to do is, so any questions about that? Okay. So now we're going to get started with goal setting and motivation. Oh. Um, let me just go ahead and screen share this with y'all. Um, and then let's see here. Give me one second. So let's got a screen share and change. And then, um, let's go here. Okay. So our model for goal setting and motivation is built on a couple of core concepts. Okay. The first is that, um, not all people are the same. So your job as a coach is to help people find a customizable solution to their individual or to their problems. Okay. The second thing is that good, oh, good diagnosis precedes good treatment. And if we look at the efficacy of a coach, um, you know, y'all aren't diagnosing or treating anything, but your efficacy as a coach and why we help clients is because like, they're actually not good diagnosticians. They will look at themselves and they won't actually accurately diagnose where their motivational problems are. Um, and then the third thing is going to be a little bit contradictory, but while personalized approaches are important, like a big part of what we do at Healthy Gamer is that we can rely on disciplines to give us framework, frameworks, uh, to give frameworks. So what we're going to do is we're going to teach all some things from neuroscience, psychology, spirituality, and things like that. And the key thing here is that if we kind of think about, okay, could any, like, couldn't anyone do this? And the answer is yes, anyone can do this. But what we're going to do is by giving you guys these key like takeaways from different disciplines, you'll be able to help a client faster and to a greater degree than they would be able to do on their own, because we're going to kind of give you all the information. Sure. And anyone out there could go and read about neuroscience, about psychology, about behavioral economics, about spirituality. And if they do enough of that self-study that like they'll be able to figure out, you know, what works for them eventually. What we try to do as coaches, though, is we, ha we have all of the relevant, not all, but, you know, we give you guys the most relevant information. And it's your job as a coach to apply that information when necessary with your client. Any questions about that? Okay. So now we're going to have kind of an interesting uh, question. So here's the basic premise under which we're going to understand motivation. So who knows what this equation is? Anyone know? Look familiar? Is that voltage equals current over resistance? Very good. Steven, bonus points because my handwriting is so bad. So who here <laughs> understands, does anyone know what voltage means? Like, what is voltage? It's like a measure of electricity, right? Like how, how strong it is? Uh, it, is it is involved in electricity. So this is Ohm's law for people who are curious. Okay, so let's let's move on to another variable. What is the I? Current, okay. <laughs> so we've got Twitch chat helping us out. So Ohm's law says basically that voltage, like Steven said, equals current over resistance, okay? So if we think about current, current is what we put into the circuit. It's the energy input, okay? Resistance is, like, what's resistance? Resistance. 
you're, you're controlling the amount of current that gets through? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of, it, it's the resistance, right? So it's like, what takes away, uh, how can I say this? It's like, what takes away whatever you're trying to do. So the other way we can think about current law, uh, takes away is a terrible definition. Hold on, let me think about what's a better definition for this. Um, you know, it's it's the force that our current has to act against. Let's call it that. Um, before It's the force opposing what we're trying to do. Okay? And then the voltage is sort of the potential difference. And the potential difference is like where you start and where you end up. So I'll give you all kind of another analogy. Let's say I have a pipe that is flowing from the second floor to the first floor, right? So the, the potential difference, like this is a measure of voltage, is like the gravitational potential from here to here is what causes water to move this way. Are we good on that? Does that make sense? Right? Because that's a gravitational potential energy. So when you look at something like a battery, that voltage across the battery, this may not be an accurate term, but if you look at like why electrons move from one point, like the cathode to the, or sorry, from the anode to the cathode, there is an electrical potential there, like a voltage that causes things to move in a particular direction. So this is where we start and this is where we end. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you also, if we think about, you know, how can I get more water over here? What are the different things that I can do to increase the water flow that's on this side? Put more water okay. in the pipe. Yep. So you can add more water, right? So that's current. We can pump more water. And what else can we do? And uh, reduce the resistance. Yep. So we can widen the pipe, right? So resistance in, in terms of flow mechanics is like the, the width of the pipe. So anyone who's, you know, had bubble tea with a bubble tea straw versus like a tiny little straw, like you get more liquid if the straw is wider, right? We can reduce the resistance. What else can we do? We can put our pipe like this. Does that make sense? So we can activate that gravitational energy like even better. Right? We can increase the strength of the cathode or the anode. So I know it sounds kind of weird, but I think this is a fantastic equation to even understand psychological resistance. So there's the goal, right? And like where you want to go. There's the energy we put in or the intent. And then there's the resistance. Right? So these are things like shame, emotions. Okay? A hum Hello? god is here too. Yeah. It's V equals IR. Uh, multiplication, not division. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that the ta uh, tanks particular things, but let's stick with this for now. <laughs> we can talk about the current instead. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's it's still fine. So just turn uh, resistance into a, a negative. It, yeah, let me think about that. Bunch of nerds. Um, let me think about that. Let me think about that. Okay, I'll get back to y'all on that. So let's kind kind of keep going for now, just because we're in this already. Um, so so this is where so as we kind of think about this in terms of like coaching, what we want to do is actually think about it this way. So when we think about a behavior, there's the intent that people put in. Okay. Then there's the resistance that they have to overcome. And then there's the action that they take towards the end. All right. So these are the three dimensions that we're going to be exploring. And in my experience, the problem that most people have with goal setting and motivation is that like they don't understand that all three of these things can be acted on. Okay. So what a lot of people will sometimes do, let's just talk about willpower for a second. So I think like I think about willpower is like a limited mana pool that you can use to kind of like power through this equation. So I can just expend a certain amount of willpower to like overcome this resistance hump and take an action one time. And then, you know, I can do that again. And each time that I like sort of drain my willpower battery, oh, damn it. What'll happen is like, I can take actions, but it's not sustainable. So we see this pattern a lot with students who are not happy with the kind of, um, uh, um, how can I say this? 
We see this a lot with students who are not like happy with being students. So they'll start the semester off with like a fully charged battery and they'll use willpower to like study for the first month. They'll like dig real deep and study for the first, the second month. And then like by the end of it, they're like burnt out and they don't really like enjoy what they're doing. They never enjoyed what they were doing. It was a slog from day one. It's just, they were relying on willpower to get there. So as coaches, what we're going to kind of focus on is understanding intent, resistance, and action. Okay. These are the three major components. So what do I mean by intent? So, so a lot of times people will say like, like, I know it sounds kind of weird, but when your clients have a goal, like, where does that goal come from? What do y'all think? Usually like desires like that are external or, or like, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, indrias, right? Okay. Desires from the indrias. Good. Indrias are sense organs. What else? Where else do does when someone says I have a goal? I want to do something. Where is that intent coming from? Why do they want to do it? Sometimes they, it's a desire. What else could it be? Could be pressure from like culture or family. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to call this should, right? So like, this is something I want to do. That's a desire. This is something I should do. What else? What else can drive someone to action? Do people do things that they don't want to do and that they should? Uh, uh, do people do things that they don't want to do and that they shouldn't do? Absolutely. Yes. Right? So this is where as we look at other things, I'm going to kind of call. So yeah, uh, okay, pressure was fine. So I'd say that we also do things because we're driven by our values. So like what drives what we want to do, our values and our duty. So these are kind of the four things that I kind of think of when I think about what goes into intent. The other key thing about, uh, so when we think about these four things, the goal of this as a coach is like a lot of t times people don't realize that the goals they set for themselves aren't truly their goals. And so the ability to get energy up and engage in those goals when this is something that I should do versus something that I actually like care about. So we see this a lot like with, you know, second generation Indians is that like everyone wants to be a doctor and very few of us actually want to be doctors. Most of us like should be doctors and there's like societal pressure to do a particular thing. We also see this a lot with our clients who, um, for example, like we don't, you know, not all of our clients are DGENs. Right. So some of our clients are actually like, you know, they have jobs and things like that. A lot of our clients do. So sometimes we see this with clients who, um, for example, like they have a job that is very successful, like they're successful, but they feel unfulfilled. And how do I like, how do I manage that? Right. Because I should stay in my job because this is a good job to have. Oh, why is it this? Okay. My pen busted? Weird. Okay, hold on. Um, let me just go, go to this in a second. So they, they may have like a particular thing that they feel like they should do or it's dumb to not do this thing. There we go. But what they really care about is something else. What they value is something else. So like I may be a successful programmer at Google, but what I care about is like running D&D &D campaigns and telling stories. And so oftentimes what keeps clients stuck is that their intent is not clarified. So there's a conflict of intent. And this is why they stay stuck. And so the key thing that we want to do here as coaches is help them clarify like, okay, what is a desire? What's something that you want? What's something that you should do? What do you care about? And what, do you, what are you duty bound to do? What's your obligation? And it's interesting, but just even having this conversation and helping people realize that, oh, this is something that you should do, but it's not something that you want to do. Do y'all think once someone understands that, are they more likely or less likely to engage in the behavior? More likely. Why do you say that, Eli? Because they're not trying to fight their emotions anymore. They can validate how they feel about it. And it kind of naturally 
like reduces the intensity of that. Perfect. So this is this. Is, I know it's kind of weird, but like I'm going to give you all uh, like a scenario. OK, I'm curious. I'm sure you all have heard this from your clients, but OK, I need to do X. I can't do X. Therefore, I'm an idiot. So we see this a lot in people with ADHD. I should be able to do X. And then let me ask you something. What do you think this statement does to their ability to like engage in action and how does that affect their motivation? It strengthens the ahamkar and makes it harder to act because now your identity is like, you know, I suck at doing stuff. So how can exactly. I ever do it? Exactly. So this is the key thing. So another key thing that we're going to do in terms of intent, we can clarify these intents, but remember that when people are stuck, oftentimes they're ambivalent, right? Can someone explain what ambivalence means? So when you like feel on the two fence. layers about one thing. On the fence. What did you say, Stephen? Just that you were feeling two ways about one thing. Yeah, feeling two ways, right? So this is the other thing. So when, when human beings don't engage in a behavior, right, they're conflicted. There's like a pro side and a con side. And one of the biggest challenges that our clients recognize is that they never see the con side. They're blind to it. So I'll give you all an example. Like they say, oh, I should study instead of playing games all day. So they don't see like the, it's one dimensional for them. Uh, this is going to sound kind of abstract, but all they see is what they should do. Like they have their eyes set on the goal and that's all they're focused on. What they don't see is what they gain by playing games all day. They don't see the other side of the equation. And so this is what creates this kind of this mentality over here. This is, this is a thought process that's created from blindness. It's a thought process that people don't realize that they can't do X for a very good reason. There's something within them that is keeping them from doing X, right? And it's not just that they're undisciplined. It's that there may have some kind of fear or they have this, like this, this identity, which is telling them, and we'll get to this in a second, like an identity that's telling them, oh, you're going to fail. So don't bother. And that's the reason that they can't do it is because there's literally a, bra a part of their brain that is calculating the likelihood of success. So there's a, there's a part of our brain that continually makes a calculation that is like, what is, what are the pros? What are the cons? What's the risk? What's the benefit? Or what's the, what's the benefit? What's the cost? And what's the likelihood of success? It's sort of like benefit minus cost times um, likelihood of success is a calculation that our mind is always doing. Anytime we're like doing anything. And then that sort of results in behavior or not behavior. And so what people don't recognize is that there's like actually a benefit to being unmotivated. So a big part of what we do here in terms of how we deal with intent, we're going to spend a whole day on this, is we're going to talk about clarifying desires, you know, shoulds, values, and duties. And when we do this with clients, like they'll be, I don't, I, it's like magic. They'll just be like more prone to um, engage in the right behavior. And it's hard to describe, but when you give human beings an open-ended uh, or like sort of an honest assessment of what something will cost them, they're more likely to pay that cost for the benefit. So by clarifying for people like, oh, if you stop playing video games and you start going to class, you're going to be behind. You're going to feel behind. You're going to, no matter how hard you study, you won't be able to get an A. And if you kind of think about it, like that's devastating for your motivation. And by helping clients understand that no matter how hard you work now, the highest grade you can get is a B. You can get 100% on every single test from here on out, and the best you can get is a B. That crushes people subconsciously. It keeps them from ever engaging in the behavior. But when you make that cost transparent to them, once they really understand and digest that cost, they are much more likely to engage in the behavior. And so this kind of hidden cost that they don't realize is also where their ambivalence comes from, because there's a subconscious part of their mind that doesn't want to pay that cost. And we know from, from evidence-based motivational interviewing that clarifying ambivalence leads people in the right direction, right? So there have been lots of studies. We teach all some motivational interviewing techniques. 
how you play with that ambivalence. And this is the really interesting thing. I had a really cool case from uh, someone presented a case in case review where someone had a client who was doing something incredibly idiotic, like just making terrible decision after terrible decision after terrible decision. Is it related to a particular relationship? And so the coach like was tearing their hair out and they're like, this is a terrible idea. You just need to go no contact with this person and cut this person out of your life. And every time that their client tells this story to their friends, their friends say the same thing. You need to go no contact with this person. Go no, go no contact with this person. This person is toxic. And then the coach was like, I have no idea how to get my client to see that this is a terrible relationship that you're engaging in and you should go no contact with them. But interestingly enough, they resisted that impulse. They didn't play into the, the drama that the client was recruiting them in. Because what do you think happens? So if, if your client tells you something that you think is idiotic and you tell them it's idiotic, how is that going to affect their behavior? Are they going to keep doing it or are they going to listen to you and stop doing it? Probably going to double down. Absolutely, right? And that's the key thing. I, I know it sounds bizarre. That's the key learning from motivational interviewing. So when you, you know, when you try to push someone in a particular direction in terms of behavior, there's a decent chance that the, the, if you're kind of pushing this way and they're ambivalent about it, oh, you need to stop fucking smoking. Like it's terrible for you. You're going to die. And like, everyone hates it. You're so bad at smoking. Oh my God. Like stop the smoking. Oh my God. What they're going to do is they're going to double down and push back twice as hard. So this is where reflective listening and sort of playing with that ambivalence and even holding the side of, oh, it sounds like, you know, you this person must mean a lot to you because it's clear that they're like really screwing with your life. So the relationship must be really important to you in some way. When you say something like that, like, what is the client going to say? Have you guys seen this play out before in coaching? Yeah, usually like some amount of confusion and just like thinking about it like, oh, shit, like, huh, you know, that kind of thing. Exactly. Right. So when you kind of say, oh, like, it sounds like this relationship is really important to you because they're super toxic and everyone's telling you to go no contact with them. They must be like super amazing. And then they're like kind of confused because that's not usually what they hear. And then they start thinking about it. And when they start thinking about it, that's when the change begins to happen. Right? It's really interesting. So this is the intent. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with ambivalence, which you guys should be pretty familiar with. We're going to teach you guys how to clarify your client's intent. And for some people, like, this is the problem. Like, they're just, their intent is confused. The next thing, in terms of resistance. <clears throat> so when someone has a clear intent, and they try to engage in a, in a um, you know, a problem, so it's V equals IR, right? Oops. <laughs> so there's resistance over here. And so, you know, the, the greater the resistance, the less likely they are to engage in um, the behavior, Right. So the two main contributions of resistance are manas or emotions and ahamkar or, or ego. Okay, what do y'all think about that? I mean, that's straight facts. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a lot to say. So we'll go into more detail. Uh, you know, so we, we have a whole day about this. So the other interesting thing is that resistance manifests as stuck behaviors. Okay? So what this means is like when people are like watching YouTube all day, when they're doing drugs, when they're gaming all day, you know, when they're procrastinating, like all these things are like manifestations of resistance. So if you kind of think about like, why do our clients like watch YouTube all day? Like, what does that do for them? Keeps them in the present. Absolutely, right? What's another way to put it? Steven here is a mindfulness chat. It, it just kind of looks like, it, I mean, the YouTube and drugs and all that stuff shuts off a lot of the madness and active ahamkar and things like that. Absolutely, right? So the YouTube, so the other way to look at it is that we can look at neuroscience articles about on internet addiction. And if we do an fMRI study, which is a study of blood flow to the brain, what we can, what we discover from these like various, you know, articles on internet addiction is that fMRI studies demonstrate that these activities shut down negative emotions circuits. 
So what they're essentially doing is actually self-medicating against this crap over here. And oftentimes, I'm sure y'all understand this as well, like, what does arguing with strangers on the internet do to your ahamkar? It's like really fun. Fantastic. So it really feeds into it. Boosts the ahamkar. And remember that the ahamkar becomes active when? What activates the ahamkar? What does it do? It's like a threat that yep. pursues you. So if I feel like a failure, and I go argue and school some noob on the internet, how do I feel? You feel good that you're like, like a pumping winner. yourself up? Yeah, right? I'm owning these noobs. Who cares that I'm 28 years old and living in my mom's basement? I'm owning noobs on the internet. I'm owning the libs. You know? I'm, I'm owning the conservatives. I'm a strong social justice warrior, and I do lots of, of virtue signaling. signaling. Or, I, I'm owning the libs. Like, it goes either way. Like, whatever it is, it's all a hump god. And so what people will do is, like, the worse they feel about themselves, the more they'll engage with these kinds of things. And this is what's great. Like, so this is where it gets really devastating. But, you know, there are platforms like Twitter and YouTube and stuff that, like, recognize that engaging people involves, like, activating their hump god. You know, so t people get pissed off on Twitter so much. Like, why is that? It's because no one can make like a fair or nuanced argument. It's all just emotionally charged crap that people are reacting to, right? There's no way to have a discussion over Twitter. You can have an argument over Twitter, you know, like, but like, you know, I, I don't know if you all saw the Jimmy from Philly interview, but like Jimmy from Philly interview is impossible to have over Twitter. You have to like actually have a conversation. You can argue with Jimmy from Philly. You could tell him he's dumb and he can tell you that you're dumb. That works great. So it's kind of interesting, but all of these things that we see in this generation, like we need to understand these principles. And as a coach, it's your job to help them overcome their resistance and kind of work through some of these behaviors and get them in the direction that they want to go. I would say that resistance is probably the biggest blind spot for our clients. And this is why oftentimes we'll do things that clients will be kind of confused about. And they'll say like, is this something I should be talking to our, my therapist about? Because you're kind of focusing on negative emotions. And you can absolutely talk to the therapist about it. And this is where it comes back to what the goals are. Because what everyone in our community knows is they know what they need to do. They just don't understand why they can't do it. And why they can't do it. So like, I know I have a clear intent. I need to do this thing. So it's this part over here that they're blind to. And so that's what we have to help them overcome. So the way that we practically are going to do that is, you know, we're, we're going to use like reflective listening and be compassionate and authentic and all that good stuff. We're going to call them out on their BS, right? When we sort of sniff it out sometimes, but we're going to do it for the purpose of growth. And as we kind of explore this stuff with them, as we sort of decompress them on us, as they no longer feel ashamed, no longer feel afraid. You know, their ego no longer needs to activate. And once their ego gets out of the way, what's left? What's running the show afterward? Anyone remember? What's the third part of the mind that we want to be operating from? Buddhi. Intellect. Yep, buddhi. And this is the big problem. If you guys, um, you know, have watched Dr. K's guide, hopefully people will understand this concept. But the, the big problem is that everyone thinks that they're, they're operating on intellect all the time. But oftentimes, it's a humkar controlling the, internet, uh, the in intellect. And so what happens is they have a lot of uh, biases, right? They think that they're behaving perfectly logically. And the person they're arguing with thinks that they're behaving perfectly logically as well. Everyone's perfectly logical because it's, my mind is logical, right? I'm not irrational. Everyone else is irrational. But as long as the ahamkar is controlling the buddhi the conclusions of the buddhi are going to be incorrect. So this is the problem is that they all think they're operating well, and this is why it's, it's tricky as a coach, but helping them recognize their blind spots in terms of emotion is how you're going to overcome the resistance. We'll give you all more techniques and more details on that yet, later. Um, and this is also what's kind of frustrating for a lot of, uh, a, a lot of our clients is when they have resistance, it's kind of like a blocked pipe. And so then what they do is they're pumping more stuff into this end right? And like, this is what leads to burnout and frustration. Because they're kind of focusing on like building up motivation and dumping energy into the system. And they dump more energy and they dump more energy and more energy. Whereas all it really takes is an elegant solution of reducing this resistance 
clearing that blockage, and then suddenly the amount of energy they need to put in the system is actually less, and they get more output. And this is where if we go back to the cases that we heard earlier, people were like, it wasn't, they weren't doing anything, they weren't doing anything, they weren't doing it, and suddenly they're crushing all their goals. Like, how the fuck does that work? It's because y'all are removing that resistance in the middle. And then suddenly they start, it starts flowing, and it feels natural. And this is the thing, is when people think about motivation, they think like, oh my god, it's like, I have to like work really hard. Uh. No, true motivation is like feels very natural. It actually feels effortless. And that's what we want to shoot for with our clients. Okay? Um, another thing that I, I should mention, so oftentimes this resistance is also a samskara. I guess that goes without saying with y'all, but, you know, just for the sake of completeness. And then we get to the third dimension, which is action. So this is probably the area at Healthy Gamer that we've been the least supportive of y'all with. Um, we really could have done a better job, and that's actually the main thing around this, um, uh, you know, this training is a big part of that. So at the end of the day, setting the right kind of goals is like really, really important for our clients. So we've got a couple of steps here. First is understand the person. So I'm going to ask y'all a couple of questions. How do your clients decide what goal to pick? <laughs> Where do their goals come from? When they want to change something. Oh. Okay, should do. Go ahead, Kent. When they want to change something about themselves. But how do they know that that's something that they should change or in what way they're going to change it? They look around a lot and see other people doing stuff or being things. All right, so what, what games? Y'all play games? What do y'all play? League. Okay, League Noob. Okay. So like, you, you know, this is kind of interesting, but like, so what, you know, if I, I, let's say I watch a video on League and I see some pro player like owning with this hero or champion, right? And then I'm like, oh, like if I want to own games and climb and gain, gain MMR, like I need to play that hero. How effective is that as a strategy to like win at league? Terrible. Why? But your character choice they, isn't why you're winning or losing. But no, Pax, dude, I saw this guy. He was crushing <laughs> with this hero. Yeah, well, maybe if you were more of a Sigma male, you would have like won with that character. Okay. Right. So it's interesting. So like this happens all the time in Dota 2 where like, you know, you'll look at what other people are owning with and you're like, oh, like I just, this happens all the time. So I don't know if, this, if you guys have had this experience where you get owned by a particular hero in a game and it's like next, like that's so easy. It's so broken. Oh my God, it's so OP. And the next game, when you queue up, you're like, I'm gonna pick that OP hero. It's gonna be an easy win. It's so broken. What happens? You get crushed. Absolutely, right? So I want you all to think about this because this is, this is legit, Okay. That's literally how our community picks their goals. They look at some random ass person and they say, look at what that person did to be successful. Let me just mimic what they did and then I will be successful. And then they get crushed. Because Steven's spot on, they look around for their goals. Okay? One of my first coaching clients ever got out of jail. And I was like, he's like, I need to find a job. And I was like, how are you, like, what kind of job do you want? And he's like, well, I have a buddy who works at a car wash, so I guess I'll work there. And it's like, hold on a second, bro. Take a big step back. You know, you've got two weeks of like stuff where you have to find a job before you start working at the car wash. Let's think about like what all of your options are. So after talking to him for a long time and like working through stuff, he started to get a job at a car wash, but he also like started getting into EMT training became him an EMT, started working as an EMT for a while, then like went into the med tech field and then is now like a, like a medical device rep or something like that. But most of what, where our clients goals come from is just like what they see other people doing. Oh, it worked for this person. It worked for, you know, reading one book a day is how this person made a million dollars. So I'm going to start reading one book a day. So the first thing that we want to do in terms of setting the right, act, the right goals is understand the person. And a lot of times, like, they don't do this step, right? They focus on, they look outside of themselves to try to figure out what the right goal is. And this can be very frustrating for our clients because they'll come in the first week and they'll be like, how do I fix my life? Give me the plan. But we can't give them the plan yet. We have to understand who they are first. Then we can worry about the plan, okay? So um, 
you know, understand the person. And the second thing is set appropriate goals. And there are a couple of techniques here that we're going to teach y'all. Right? So, so it's not going to be you set the goal for them. It's the two y'all are going to like work together to set the right goal. And then, you know, you're going to develop a, an action plan. They're going to try it. And when they try it, what's going to happen? They're going to do it. It's They're going to fail. Way. They're going to fail. Excellent. Then what's your job as a coach? Provide compassion through their trial and error. Excellent. Because here's the big thing, right? So when I when I set a goal for myself and I fail, like that creates all the crap, mana, sahamkar, all that sort of stuff. So as a coach, we're going to help them pick, pick themselves up off the ground, dust themselves off, and try again, right? So we're going to provide emotional support, and we're also going to provide feedback. So we're going to be a lens, because in that mindset, like it's hard to be objective, right? So we're going to be objective for them, and we're going to try to figure things out. And then essentially our, you know, our goal setting and like accountability, uh, you know, approach as coaches is iterative. Who knows what this word means? It means you have to iterate, which means each time something goes wrong, you change one thing and you keep doing that until you find something that works. Yep. Perfect. Right. So we want to set appropriate. So as a goal, we want to set uh, as coaches, we want to set appropriate goals. These goals should factor in strengths and weaknesses of the client, right? Next thing that we need to do, support them when they screw up. And then fourth thing is iterate. How can we, okay, how can we do it better next time? And so in my experience, when y'all do this, okay, when you clarify intent, when you work with their resistance, when you set appropriate goals, this is how you help someone change their life. Questions? Yeah, I had one question about the, um, you said your first client, you know, he got out of jail and then, you know, he was like, okay, I should start working at the car wash because my friend is there. The, the way you told the story, it sounds like, you know, you kind of immediately kind of like he said that and then you were like, well, hang on, like, let's think about this. Um, I don't know if that's how it actually panned out or if that was just like the summary version, because, you know, my understanding is like sometimes like, you know, it kind of depends on where you're at with like the relationship. But sometimes like putting the brakes on something, you know, like those that kind of assumption is like, you know, you kind of have to like let it ride for a little bit first before you can like actually explore alternatives. But it sounds like the way you told it was like you went straight to there. Yeah, so I'll tell you what I did. I think y'all would handle this. Y'all would have done the same, basically. Um, so I basically asked him, help me understand. Or let me ask you. So if, if your client, let's see if y'all, uh, I'll just say it. So I, I asked him, like, help me understand, like, how you came to the conclusion to work at the car wash. Right. And then I asked, like, you know, simple open-ended questions that made him realize that he had, like, huge errors in his thought process and catalyzed change, which is, what else did you consider? And he was like, I didn't consider anything else. That's not what he said. He's like, I don't know. Right? So like people don't, so this is the big problem. This is why y'all are useful, to be blunt, is because people don't, they're blind to their own blind spots. Right? That's the biggest problem. So if we think about like why people stay stuck, like human beings are smart, especially our community. Like if they understand a problem correctly, they will fix it themselves. So by definition, the problems that people get stuck on are the ones that are misdiagnosed. This is a concept that started with Carl Jung. And he kind of said, like, everyone has a shadow. And the most growth that a human being can have is in looking at the shadow. Because the shadow is the part of yourself that, by definition, you neglect to look at. And so, like, most of the things, like, if there's one part of the world that's, like, forbidden, that's where there's the most opportunity for discovery. Does that make sense, Pax? Oh, for sure. Right? So, so like, in terms of how I work with this person, so I asked him, like, what else did you consider? And he's like, what? That's not how he operates, right? He doesn't, like, he doesn't think about approaching his life in a systematic way. He just kind of, like, does what he sees other people doing, which is how most of us do it, 
It's how our brain, it's monkey see, monkey do, right? That's how, like, you think about how you learn slang. Like, how does that happen? There's no intent. There are, like, circuits in your brain that are literally designed to adjust your behavior based on what you see and shape your behavior. I don't know if y'all have ever, like, lived in a different country where there was, like, a social custom that, like, people there didn't do. So for me, it's like shaking hands. It's like I went to India and I'd like shake people's hands and they were like confused because they don't do that there. And after a while, I kind of stopped. Right. So I just like and so there's like literally a part of my brain that's like constantly adjusting how I view situations. And then over time, I started asking questions like, what do you care about? You know, like, do you are you passionate about car washes? Like, do you want to be an entrepreneur? Do you want to open up your own car wash one day? And he's like, no. And he's like, what he cared about was excitement. So his options were like, join the military or like do something else that's exciting. So I would ask him like, what do you find exciting? He's like, I think combat would be cool. I was like, okay, what else? And he's like, well, like maybe like being a police officer. And then we kind of stumbled on EMT. And I was like, okay, like maybe if you want to, you know, go into combat, maybe EMT training would be helpful. And he hated school. Like he hates, he hated EMT training. But he was totally fine doing, gave it 100% because like, oh, like this is going to be useful for me, even though I detest doing it. Going to school for the purpose of like, it's good for me is not a good motivator. Even doing school that you detest doing because he wants to live an exciting life. He doesn't want to sit in a classroom somewhere and telling him, hey, if you like wind up in combat somewhere, maybe it'll be useful to get EMT skills. And he's like, yeah, I can get behind that. And then he's motivated. Right. And then you do like further work with him. You ask him, you know, why are you craving excitement? Things like that. You kind of get deeper and deeper. And then eventually he ends up with one of the most boring jobs in the universe. Or maybe it's exciting. I don't know. But he's a medical device rep. He likes his job. He's happy. Has the added benefit of, you know, lower chance of casualty. Other questions? Yeah, I'm curious where like focus or attention comes into play to like motivation or like the intent resistance action. Uh, the focusing of attention? Yeah, like yeah. focus, attention, stuff like that. So we'll get into that. So there's stuff um, that there's a lot of stuff that has to do with motivation, which is a little bit outside the scope of, of coaching. But when we think about that intent, so focus is there is what I would put on the intent side. So if we think about like, if, check out, I don't know if y'all have watched, if y'all watched the video on Dharana or the origin of motivation in Dr. K's guide, y'all gone through that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff there, but basically if we think about how do you sustain motivation, I recognize that we just sort of said motivation isn't one thing, but I, I'd say that f <coughs> focusing your attention is like the major way of doing it. And where does attention fit into that graph, it fits into the intention side. It's the energy that you put in. So the more focused your mind is, the more like cognitive energy you can leverage into a particular thing. Wouldn't it also come into play into action to keep yourself like focused on what you're doing? Yes, you could definitely put it there. Um, it, 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 that has probably more to do with the way that I'm defining action, which is like around appropriate goal setting and adjusting expectations and things like that. So it's absolutely a part of like physically what they have to do. Yes, absolutely. But in terms of, and so this is what's a little bit different about talking about motivation in general and talking about it as a coach. So what we're doing here is trying to help you figure out how can you like essentially like increase you know, the gravity of their situation so that the the potential difference between where they want to go and where they are, where they are and where they want to go is like easy for them. That's your goal as a coach, right? So an example of that is, you know, y'all know the, the, you know, the half of half rule in terms of goal setting. You guys have picked this up yet? So in terms of goal setting, what we recommend is think about where you are, think about where you want to go, cut that in half, and then cut that in half again. That should be your first target. So that's something that the parent program was very successful because of like that principle. Because all these parents like have this idea that they want they want to transform their kids into like, you know, 4.0 valedictorians who are playing sports and, you know, learning a musical instrument. It just like ain't going to happen. You got to like adjust your expectations and start small. And then like over time, like it's interesting because we can get 100% of the way there. Like it's absolutely possible. 
We just want to start in a particular way as a coach. You want to help your client set a goal for themselves that they can achieve and then like build on that success. And then the challenge, we'll get to this in the goal setting, but the challenge with that is that they're going to say like, what is a client going to say if, if they say, oh, I want to like, I need to like, you know, get a 4.0 and you tell them like, why don't you start with a 2.0? What's their resistance going to be? That's not good enough. Exactly. Right. So that's where you do the work as a coach of helping them let go of that idea. Like not good enough is not a reason to per- keep from acting. You got to start somewhere. Like if you end up with a 4.0, great. But if you open, if you never crack the book because you're saying to yourself, whatever I do today is not going to be good enough. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is why they believe it in the first place. Because what they've tried in the past has not been enough. So you got to get underneath that and like help them dismantle the idea of like not good enough. It's not a thing. There's only action. 